Hey everyone, how you doing? We're coming back with section 4.3 and today we're going to look at the derivatives of inverse functions. Very mysterious. Let's get to it. So to start off with, the derivative of an inverse function, um, we're going to actually sketch a few inverse functions. So the key here is that the inverse function is just a place where the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate have been inter-exchanged. So if I look at this, this first piece, I've got, um, what is this? The coordinate is 0, 1. So in the inverse function, the coordinate will be 1, 0. So I'll go ahead and put a point over there. Uh, here's another one. Uh, the x-coordinate is negative 2, and the y-coordinate is 0. So if I switch those around, then the x-coordinate is going to be 0, and the y-coordinate is going to be negative 2. All right, those are the only two, line, the only two points we're going to need, because, of course, these are straight lines. There we go. But of course, I don't know the difference between, between positive 2 and negative 2, so that did look kind of funny. Uh, let's try this again. There we go. Okay, so you will notice whenever we're doing these that the inverse function will always have a, or if you graph the inverse function and the function itself, you will always see th some symmetry about the line y equals x. So here's a line of y equals x, and I don't know how well I did on that, but that is the way it goes. Let's take a look at number two, and number two, we're going to interchange some of the points. Uh, here's one point, that's 0, 0. Um, no point in interchanging the x and y coordinate there. Uh, how about over here? This looks like 1, 1. Um, again, no point in interchanging any coordinates there. That's not going to work. Um, how about over here? We've got negative 1, negative 1. Again, not so much over there either. But then if we go further, this looks like it would be like 2, 8. So if we switch that, that would be 8, 2. And that would be way out over here. Likewise, uh, this looks like it would be 2, negative 8. And if we switch that, that would be negative 2. I'm sorry, negative 2, negative 8. So if we switch that, that would be negative 8, negative 2 over here. And so you'll see that when you graph it, you're going to get what looks like a per cubic function sideways. It looks like I was much more successful with this one. You can definitely see that there is a line of reflection right along that diagonal axis, y equals x. All right, so you have the rest of the two. Go ahead and get to those. And let's take a look. Uh, we'll answer number five later. So it does look like I've made a mess of things over here, but I think you can see the line of symmetry on all of these. Maybe we'll expand these, number four. Maybe I should have drawn these expanded too. Okay, yeah, that does look like a, a hot mess now, don't it? Uh, this one's a little bit better. So which of these, which of the following have inverse functions? So they have an inverse function if they pass the horizontal line test. So let's take a look which ones of these pass a horizontal line test. Uh, let's just draw a couple horizontal lines, or as close as we can. So that looks like it passes a horizontal line test, so this should have an inverse. This one over here, uh, letter B, by its very nature, you know, this is what we call the step function. That does not pass a horizontal line test, so nope. How about this one? This is a rather jagged piecewise function, probably. And yeah, this seems to pass the vertical line test. So letter C. Uh, letter D, that's a parabola, and nope. Letter E, uh, that looks linear, and that definitely passes a horizontal line test. And finally, letter F, um, just drawing a couple horizontal lines. Yeah, that seems to pass. So there we go, A, C, E, and F. Those seem to all have inverses. 
Now of these functions that have inverses, we can tell um, if the inverse is the same as the original graph, if the original exhibits um, symmetry about the line y equals x. So what I'm going to do is let it for letters a, c, e, and f, let's just draw the line y equals x and see what happens. So looking at letter a, no, that doesn't quite work. Uh, I don't see it being symmetric. Uh, I see portions of the graph here that are below the x-axis um, and nothing to actually um, counterbalance that out. So no, that's not going to work. Letter E, sorry, letter C, again, this, no, uh, there is no symmetry here. Letter E, well, that is the line y equals x, or as far as we can tell, that's the line y equals x. So yeah, I think there is symmetry there. So that is going to have an inverse function that looks exactly like it. And this function, this looks like the graph of y equals x. And if we take a look here, this part over here is symmetric to this part up here. This part over here is symmetric to this part down here. So that seems like it has symmetry about the line y equals x, meaning that the inverse function should look exactly like the function that we started off to begin with. So we're talking about letters E and F only. Part seven, if f of g of x is equal to g of f of x is equal to x itself, g and f are what we would call inverse functions. That is the analytic definition of what an inverse function is. So there we go, we have inverse functions. Um, and then letter, letter number eight is actually going to be one that is gonna be challenging because we wanna find an expression for f prime if we know that f of g of x is equal to x. So assume f and g are both uh, differentiable. So over here on the side, uh, let's write that down. G of f of g of x equals x. f of g equals x. And then we're going to take the derivative of both sides, and I'm going to take the derivative with respect to x. OK, so I know you're itchy to take the derivative of the right side. Uh, that's clearly 1. And the derivative of the left side is going to be um, how do I say this? It's going to be the chain rule. So let's take the derivative of the left side using the chain rule. So there we go. The derivative of a function inside of a function is the derivative of the outer function with the inside function still inside of it, the inside function in this case being g of x, multiplied by the derivative of the inner function, g prime. And if I solve for g prime, I get g prime of x equals 1 over f prime of g of x. Okay. Now to get this in the form that we're used to seeing it, um, we're going to take a note that if g, if f of a equals b, that means g of b equals a. So we're saying that let's, re let's replace all of our x's with b. So we got g prime of b is equal to 1 over f prime of g of b. Well, what is g of b? Well, g of b is just a. So the derivative of g of b equals 1 over f prime of a. So you will notice that a and b here form a coordinate pair. So the derivative of the inverse evaluated at the y-coordinate is equal to 1 over the derivative of the original function evaluated at the x-coordinate. Let's write that down over here. Of course, reading over there, um, I notice that I have the solved for the wrong quantity. So what we, re what we really want is f prime of b. So f prime of b is 1 over g prime of a. So 
f prime of b equals 1 over g prime of a, where f of a is equal to b. So that should hopefully uh, solve it out. So in the way that we've thought about it for letter number 8, these here would be our a's and these would be our b's. So if I want to find derivatives of g, g prime, which would be the inverse function, then I'm really finding, instead of the inverses, the derivatives for a, I'm finding the derivatives for b, through negative 3, negative 2, and 1. And of course, g of negative 3 is 1, g of negative 2 is 2, g of 1 is 3. If so, g prime would be 1 over f prime of the corresponding uh, x coordinate. So this would be 1 over f prime of 1. This would be 1 over f prime of 2. And this is 1 over f prime of 3, which is, well, 1 of f prime of 1, 1 over 1 half is 2. 1 over uh, 2 is 1 half, and 1 over 4 is 1 fourth. These are all coming from here, of course. So to hopefully make it plainer, if f of 1 equals 3, then g prime of, sorry, if f of 1 is negative 3, then g prime of negative 3 is 1 over f prime of 1. And if f of 2 is negative 2, then g prime of negative 2 is 1 over f prime of 2. And lastly, if f of 3 equals 1, then g prime of 1 equals 1 over f prime of 3. Let's get these line tangent line equations out of the way. So we want to find the equation of a line tangent to the graph of y equals f of x at x equals 1. So let's remember that we're going to be writing the equation of a line in this modified point slope form. So you have y equals mx minus x naught plus y naught. And then when we look back over here to number 10, you get y equals f prime of 1 multiplied by x minus 1 plus f of 1. Well, what is f prime of 1 and f of 1? Yeah, y is equal to 1 half x minus 1 plus negative 3. Is it worth it for you to do all the algebra to simplify that? No, it is not. You're in calculus, not in algebra. Next, number 11. Find the tangent line to y equals g of x at x equals 1. We're going to play by the exact same rules. y equals g prime of 1 multiplied by x minus 1 plus g of 1. And if you look up at the chart, that gives you y equals 1 fourth x minus 1 plus 3. And I'm looking at my mistake over here. Uh, no, no, that's fine. y equals all of that. Lastly, find the equation of a line normal to g of x at x equals 2. So let's remember our normal line equation. The normal line is just like the normal line, except for instead of using the same slope as the derivative, you use a negative reciprocal of this slope. So now all we have to do is plug in uh, our g prime of 2 and our, sorry, g prime of negative 2 and g of negative 2. So there we go. Uh, two, negative 2, x plus 2, plus 2, or if you want to simplify that out. Um, I won't like it, but that's your that's your math. Okay, that's it for the derivatives of inverse functions. I hope you enjoyed this one. I know I did. I'll see you next time.